Um, this Sunday, uh, I have a message for the new year. Last year was a uh, last year and last week was a, sort of a transitional message, and this morning, um, I again I have just a very specific message that the Lord spoke to me uh, earlier this week. I was um, I was all ready to take a break, um, and Pastor Renee was all ready to start preparing, but uh, I had just been praying that afternoon as I was climbing my prayer mountain, you know, behind the house. And as I was praying for us and just praying, the Lord gave a, a, a thought and then a message for us for as we, as we go into 2019 this year. And then a few minutes after that, Pastor Renee sent me a message and he said, I guess I'm, I'm speaking this weekend unless you have a message. And I thought, oh, I said, yes, I have a message. I'll preach. So he said, okay, great. <laughs> but you'll hear from Pastor Renee next week. Um, so... Uh, we're going to look this morning, very, very practical message, um, biblical, we always try to bring biblical messages, but very practical message for us as we look at this new year, and it's very simply entitled, First, A Year of Blessing, and um, <coughs> as we start looking at some of these scriptures, you're going to wonder why have you titled it first, but we'll get to that, and we're going to look at two main passages this morning, a couple other small scriptures, but two main passages. So if you have your Bibles, if you have a paper Bible, does anybody have a paper <coughs> Bible here this morning? We, we have moved beyond. Mercy has a paper Bible. A pen and, John Lamont has a paper Bible. I miss paper Bibles sometimes, pen and ink Bibles. I really do. I like being able to turn from page to page and see where it looks on the page. And sometimes when I'm using my electronic bi Bible, I kind of get, oh, even pastors can get distracted and go this way and that way, right? So <laughs> sometimes it's, it, it's good for us to, to return to the old ways. But um, we're going to look at two passages this morning. Jeremiah 17 and Matthew 6. Those are the two main passages, Old Testament and New Testament, okay? And then I'm going to give you a couple other small examples. So if you want to just put your fingers in both of those, um, we're going to look at those two. We're going to start off with the Old Testament. And um, so uh, I want to ask you something as we, as we look at this this morning, and, and I, it's really, really practical. I, I mean this uh, um, message for us that I believe is from the Lord for each one of us. And um, before I have brought it to you, I've had to pray it through in my own life as well and to work out some things in my own life as well. And Lord willing, brothers and sisters, as your pastors, one of the things we do our best, we're imperfect, we're human, but one of the things we do our best to do is when we come to you and we bring you the word of God, we never want to bring you a word from God that we have not worked through our own lives and filtered through our own lives because if we do if we don't do if we don't do that then there's no authenticity for us to preach to you and our own lives are in trouble and so we we do we do want to do that and we do try to do that so you pray for us as we preach to you and as we as we pastor you and, and lead you <coughs> so i want to ask you a question this morning if you had the power a superpower um, if you had the power to choose what type of year you would have this year what would you choose wouldn't we all like that ability to choose what type of year we're going to have? I, I was imagining things uh, yesterday as I was working on my notes. Um, before we lose our heads and go crazy, uh, if I were to say, okay, you have the power to choose this year. Some of us might say, I want to win Mark 6 every week of 2019, <laughs> perhaps. Um, or, now be honest, some of you are laughing, you're saying, oh, I'm very spiritual. Oh, come on. How many of you would love to make, win Mark 6 every week for, for, for the year of 2019? Probably a lot of us would. <laughs> or um, we'd like to, uh, those of us who drive cars, for example, to have a really good year. I'd like to say that every time I drive onto Hillwood Road, I would find a parking place right out there. I, instead of paying huge amounts of money. Um, those of you that say, well, I don't have a car. Well, when you get on the MTR or a bus, there would, there would be a seat for you every single time. Um, and magically, you'd always have something. Or, or we, we, we think about these things that are kind of funny. These are lighthearted examples. Um, <coughs> but what I want to say to you this morning is this. In fact, we have the power to choose what type of year we're going to have in this upcoming year. We have the power to choose if we're going to have 
a year that is not blessed or a year that's blessed. Did you know that? That's, that's in your hands and that's in my hands. Well, if this power is in our hands, if this choice is ours, I want to know how I can choose. Do I just say, okay, God, I want a blessed year? Now, that would be nice, and we pray for a year of blessing. But what I want to say to us this morning, we're going to look at some very practical scriptures, is this. The choice is ours, but the choice is not as easy as saying, yes, God, I want a year of blessing. I don't want your accursed year. I want a blessed year. There are things that we do that we can put into place in our lives that will give us a year of God's favor and God's blessing. Now, before you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're starting to get, that's getting close to heresy. Uh, Pastor Renee and I laugh sometimes, and we get a little frustrated sometimes when we see things so often on YouTube. You know, these things pop up and um, they say, I proclaim to you a year of favor and God's this and this and this. It drives me crazy crazy. It really does. Because just proclaiming God's favor and God's blessing does not make it so. The Bible is very clear about how we can live with the blessing of God. So that's what we're going to look at um, <coughs> for 2019. And we're going to get to first in just a minute. So we're going to turn first of all to Jeremiah 17. And it's in verses, uh, we're going to look at verses 5. Oh, I need to turn it on, don't I? It's on. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, I spoke from this passage, I think, about 10 years ago, at 10 or more years ago, but I promise I didn't go back and look at my notes. This is what the Lord gave me for this morning, and I want to just look at this briefly and then keep on, and then keep on going as well. But look at me, uh, look with me uh, at Jeremiah. Uh, we're going to look at verses 5 through 8, but I've, I've divided it. So we read in verses 5 and 6, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those, we're going to get to blessing, but we got to start with cursed, okay? Cursed are those who put their trust in man, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert and shall not see any good come, or there's no hope for the future. That's another way to put it. They will live in the parched, barren wilderness in a salty land where no one lives. So God, who has inspired uh, this message gives us a really, really vivid example. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a wilderness area before. Uh, some of you have. Have you ever seen a stunted shrub in the desert? All whatever. And it's stunted because there's, not, there's almost no water there. There's not enough in the ground. There's not enough in the ground to sustain vigorous life. And <coughs> so God says, this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who put their trust in man, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. Now, y'all are above average for sure, so I hope you're ahead of me on this. Um, let's look at verses 7 and 8. So here's one option that God gives, and then God gives another option. He says, but blessed are those, there's our word, okay, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. By the way, the ESV translation says, uh, who put their trust in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. And I like that. It really emphasizes, uh, it emphasizes what our outlook should be and where our hearts should be and what our, our focus and what our direction should be. So, so then God says, they're like a tree, planted by water that sends out roots by the stream. Such a tree does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves stay green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it never stops producing fruit. So I don't want to re-preach an old message today, but I want to ask you this morning, if you're choosing for 2019, do you want to be a stunted desert shrub, or do you want to be a tree planted by water? What's your choice, brothers and sisters? <laughs> Tree planted by water. If you choose stunted, stunted desert shrub, um, please come talk to us after the service. You need prayer and maybe deliverance. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <coughs> but here are our choices. Now, all of us would say, duh, of course I want to be a tree planted by the water. But there are things that we do, there are things that we choose to be trees 
planted by the water in 2019. There are things that you and I have to choose if we want the blessing of God in 2019. And I don't know about you, but I want the blessing of God in 2019. I, I want the blessing of God in every area of my life. I need the blessing of God in every area of my life. I really do. Don't you? We all do, don't we? We want and we need the blessing of God in every area of our lives. And so um, when we look at it this way, <laughs> it's a pretty easy answer. You want a cursed life or a blessed life in 2019? Blessed life. Blessed life, we all say, but I want us to look for a little while this morning at how we can choose the blessed life. It goes beyond saying, I want a blessed life. It goes beyond some prophet standing over you and pronouncing, I pronounce over you the year of the Lord's favor. Um, now, prophets led of God can do things like that at times when it's a message from the Lord. But I'll be really honest with you folks. Most of this stuff that's floating around in church circles where these big pronouncements and this and I speak to you this and that or whatever, it's a bunch of junk. It really is. It's a bunch of junk. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. This is how God works. And honestly, when we look at this, it's, it's actually, it's really clear. It's not rocket science, is it? And so we want to look at this, and we want, we want a year of blessing. We want a year of God's favor. Now, before some of you think, Pastor Jennifer, you're overstepping, you're overstating, um, it's not really that simple. You're, 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 you, you mean a cursed life or a blessed life. I want you to look with me again at the passage. And this time I want to just put it all together. Let's take the pictures off. You know, I'm a very visual person, so a lot of times I'll put pictures up just to help us see. Um, <coughs> but let's put the whole passage together. Uh, let's put the passage together now as we look at these two things again. And I want to ask you something. As you look at this passage, verses 5 through 8, what's the most important part? Uh, what are the most... What, let me make it singular. What's the most important part of this passage? Look at it just a minute. Now some of us might say, oh, verse 7, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord. I don't think that's the most important part. That's the most important part of this passage. What's the most important part? I think it's right at the beginning. Look with me. Verse 5. This, that struck me. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. It's not what Pastor Jennifer says. It's not what Pastor Renee says. Now we come to you with the word of the Lord. We come to you with things from the Bible. And we have to be careful because there's an interpretation and it comes through a human instrument. I'm a human instrument. I, do I always get things perfectly exactly right? Maybe not, but I'm really trying to. Pastor Renee, same thing for both of us. So we have to be careful when we come to interpretation of the Bible, but we still come back to this. Verse 5 begins with, this is what the Lord says. Brothers and sisters, I, 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 those of you that have your paper Bibles, hold them up again. You too. John and Mercy, and over there as well. Hold, these th hold those Bibles up. Hold those Bibles up. When we come to this book, Never forget, everybody. You can look around if you want to. You can hold up the electronic one, but uh, it seems a little strange, right, when we Google and YouTube and everything else, and Facebook on that as well. We come to this book. It's what the Lord says, right? Okay, you can put the Bibles down. Thank you so much for that practical demonstration. Brothers and sisters, we come to this book by every day, I hope. We come to this book every week. And when you come, Come with this, fr this framework. Come with this mindset. Come with this outlook. Come with, come with these ears. Come with this heart. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. We live in a world with so many voices. Ah, oh, some people say this. Some people say that. That's your opinion. Well, that's your opinion. And these days, I was talking with some Christian friend, friends this week. We, were, we had met together for some things. And we were talking about some of the things that the Bible says. And these days, sometimes, if you say, well, the Bible says this, at least in the West, or at least in the U.S., do you know what people will say to you? Oh, you're a hater. Have you heard that before? You have if you're in North America. Oh, you're a hater. Well, I think Melrose has heard it sometimes, too, with the youth. I don't know. You're a hater. But brothers and sisters, what we do is we come back to what does the, this is what the Lord says, okay? This is what the Lord says. So as we come to this year, 2019, and as we make our choices, this is what...
the Lord says, right? If you're with me, you can kind of nod your head or whatever. This is what the Lord says. And so <coughs> what does the Lord say? He keeps it very simple for us in this passage, and he gives us two roads. He gives us two choices. He gives us two examples. One of them is cursed. One of them is blessed. And he makes the equation very simple for us. One road is blessed because it's a pathway that counts on God, that depends on God for his help and for his provision. And there's one that depends on our own way, depends on others, depends on all we can do. And God says, the Lord says, if you choose that way, it's, it's cursed. And some of us say, ah, oh, I don't like that word very much, do you? I don't either. I, I was thinking about it, and honestly, I was kind of, I wanted to kind of pull my punches just a little bit, if, if you will, because I thought, if I say it that way, God, it sounds so strong. It sounds so hard. But this is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man. And what does that mean for us? Does that mean that God up in heaven looks down and says, I curse you because whatever, whatever, whatever? No, that's not what it means at all, because God loves you. God loves you. He's a God of love, as we're going to see in just a minute. But what it does mean is this. What God says is, I bless what honors me. I bless my priorities. I bless my ways. I bless the one who chooses my ways. I bless the one whose life is in order according to my order. But I cannot bless what is not honoring to me. I cannot bless what is out of order. I cannot bless what depends not on me, but on themselves and on their own ways. And where God cannot bless, it's cursed. It's cursed. There's no life there. And so <coughs> don't look at this and think, well, God is so hard. He's cursing us. No, no. God doesn't curse. Do you know where the curse comes from? It comes from sin and the devil. And when we choose anything less than God and anything less than God's ways, then that's what we're choosing. And so God wants us to see the picture very, very clearly this morning. That's why I think these, these examples are so, so strong for us this morning. I hope it's sort of striking you. You may not have thought it. I thought of it that way before. You may have just thought of it, well, I, I want to do my own thing. Well, I know what to do. I know how to do it. And God says, let me tell you what I say about it. And so this is what we, the, here's, what, here's what we see. Now I want to say something this morning. As we look at this, here we are all in church. Most of us, if not all of us, took communion this morning, the Lord's Supper. Most, if not all of us, put money in the offering. Most, if not all of us, were singing praises to the Lord this morning. And, and perhaps some of us are automatically assuming, well, I'm here because I'm a child of God. And, and I'm blessed because I'm God's child. This is for those heathens out there in the world. May I give you the context of this passage? It's Jeremiah. And God's talking to Jeremiah. And do you know who he's talking about? He's talking about his chosen people, Israel. He's talking about his chosen people, Israel. Here's the context here. Jeremiah was talking to God about, oh God, it's tough. These are the things that are going on. These are the things that are happening. And God said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, cursed are those, whatever, blessed are those. You see, Israel was scared because Assyria, the nation of Assyria, and Babylon were going to come against them. In fact, they had already begun to come against them, and they were strong and powerful. Do you know what Israel had done? to protect itself as Assyria and Babylon came against them and there was the threat of Assyria and Babylon, they made a political alliance. Not with God. God, you're our God. We're your people. You'll take care of us, which is what God had al always told them. Do you know what Israel did to protect themselves? They made an alliance with you will never believe this. Some of you have read it so you remember. What country? What nation? Egypt. Egypt. Seriously? Are you kidding me? The nation 
out of which God had delivered his people. He brought them out of Egypt. And remember what he said? Never go back to Egypt. I'm bringing in you into a, a different land. I will be your God. I will take care of you. And what had Israel gone? Time had gone on and Israel had come to the place. What are we going to do? Here's Babylon. Here's Assyria. They're coming against us. What shall we do? And they looked at their own resources and they looked at what they could do and then they looked at Egypt and they said, Egypt will help us. Now we look at this and we're horrified. We think, stupid Israel. Foolish Israel. How could you do something like that? Brothers and sisters, this morning, I am so sorry to tell you, but you know what? We, too, are sometimes just as foolish and just as stupid. We really are. We make, let me put it this way, we make alliances with people and things and whatever that are not of God because we're trying to make our own way because we're trying to solve our problems, because we're trying to make things work, because we've got to have an answer. And God, where are you? Well, God has, God's not helping. God's not answering. Well, I've got to do something. This is what I'll do. And as Christians, we're just as foolish as Israel was. True, not true. Yes. True. It's true. So that's the context. <coughs> that's the context. And what God said to His people then, He says to us today, if we rely on human strength, human ability, human power, human re reasoning, whether it's ourselves. Some of us are very, very self-reliant, right? Don't raise your hands. Some of us are really self-reliant. We're, we're really independent. I can do it. How many of you have said that before or you've thought that before? I can make it happen. I can do it. I, I've known people like that, but all of us are like that. What I want to say to you is this. If you're depending on yourself and everything you can do and your own ability and your own connections and your own weaseling and your own finagling and your own whatever, God says to you this morning, you are going to be disappointed. You are going to be disappointed. Why? Because the strongest arm, the strongest arm will fail given enough pressure and given enough weight. And if you're depending on yourself and your own ways this morning and you say, so far so good, the full pressure hasn't hit yet. The full weight hasn't hit yet. But at some point it will. And so rather than thinking God is hard to me this morning, He's being mean, why God, why are you saying that? Would you, with me instead, change the way you're thinking and understand and realize God loves you? And God is saying to us this morning, as you look ahead at this year, the problems that you have, and you're going to have them. You say, oh, but I'm a child of God. You're going to have problems. Um, but I'm a child of God. You're going to have difficulties. But I'm a child of God. I'm so sorry. I, you're probably going to get sick sometime this year. I'm not pronouncing curses upon you but we live in imperfect and broken human bodies and things happen. <coughs> God says, but if you will choose this way instead, you will be blessed. You're going to have a blessed year. Now, look with me, at, um, without going into a lot of detail. Uh, here we've looked at this extreme picture of the stunted shrub, but I want you to look at this beautiful picture here uh, in verse 8. And it says, uh, so our hope and our confidence is in the Lord. Uh, what are we like? So it, he's not talking about trees, brothers and sisters. Not talking about trees. He's talking about people. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. We are like, if we'll put our hope in the Lord, we're like a tree planted by water that sends out roots by the stream. Such a tree does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves stay green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it never stops producing fruit. Another uh, translation for anxious, depending on what Bible translation you have, is worry. It's not worried. And I was, I was looking at that. Uh, a few of you speak German here. Not many, but a few of you. And one of the things I, I, uh, I, I noticed as I was doing some studying was this word anxious or worry, the English word anxious or worry, uh, comes from an old German word which means 
to strangle or to choke. How many of you, at times when you have been worried or anxious, it's, it's like something that you're almost strangled, right? You almost, how many of you have, have almost, you've gotten to the place where it's like, I, I can't even breathe. I can't, I, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And it's crushing to us, isn't it? It's crushing to us. The Bible says, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now there's a whole world out there that he is stealing from, killing from, killing and destroying, and destroying the things of. But what I want to say to you is this, you are also his target. And if he can steal your peace, he will steal your peace. If he can kill your dreams, he will kill your dreams. If he can destroy the hope that you had, he will destroy the hope that you had. And God who loves you, your Heavenly Father, as we're going to see in Matthew 6 in just a minute, says, I don't want that for you. I love you. Choose this instead. Choose this. And if you will, you will be like a tree that's planted by a stream. When I was taking, when I was making the picture uh, <coughs> yesterday, does this go backwards? <laughs> it does. Okay, let me go backwards. I'm, so, I'm low tech. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I looked at some pictures first. I don't want to preach pictures. I want to preach the Bible. But I looked at some pictures first that showed these great trees that were by these beautiful rivers. And I was going to choose that at first. But I thought, no, that's not an accurate representation of what God's talking about here in Jeremiah 17. Do you know what the accu accurate representation is? It's an irrigation stream. It's a water stream that has been prepared there. It's been put there by a person. And I thought, thank you, Lord, because you know what? We don't put irrigation ditches. We don't put irrigation streams in areas where there's plenty of water everywhere. We don't put irrigation streams where, oh, the ground is so rich and there's so many resources. No. Irrigation streams, irrigation ditches are put in places where there's not enough water, where there's not enough resource. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world most of the time. We are in situations most of the time. We're in work situations or family situations or whatever situations where resources aren't enough, where we are pressed, where it feels like the desert to us. And what God is saying to us this morning is this, in your desert, I'm going to make a stream for you. In your desert, here. I'm going to plant you beside an irrigation ditch and I'm going to supply the water. And because I supply the water, your roots are going to go into me. And I love that. And that's why I chose that instead of this beautiful river with this great tree. This is a more accurate representation. And so that encourages me and it should encourage you this morning that when hard times, hard times come, as they will come, look at this. Such a tree does not fear when heat comes. Now, brothers and sisters, that's real preaching. That's the real word of God. It is not this hocus pocus mumbo jumbo that preachers say, oh, you will fear no this. You will have no that. That's, I don't find that in my Bible. I don't know what Bible they're reading. It's not in my Bible. God says, the Lord says, when heat comes. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something this morning. 2019. Heat is coming. Heat is coming sometimes. And it's not anxious in the year of drought. I want to tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. There may be some drought times in 2019. In fact, there will be some drought times in 2019. But that's not the final message. That's not the final word. Here's the final word. Such a tree does not fear when the heat comes. So when the heat comes this year, if you are a tree planted by the rivers of, by this, this water stream because you are trusting in the Lord and you're receiving the Lord's blessing, you're not going to be afraid when it comes. Oh, there may be some momentary, oh God, we, we're like that at times. What will I do? And all of us, our hearts jump up in fear all along, right? And things grip us. God is not up in heaven saying, Oh, you're a bad Christian. You're afraid. No. Uh, that's just, it's a momentary. But you don't live in fear, do you? You don't live in fear. Such a tree does not fear when heat comes. Why? Because its leaves stay green. You know, I've talked to you before about when I was trying to grow tomatoes. Not a successful tomato farmer. 
or gardener. I'm a much better preacher than I am a tomato farmer. Andrew's a great tomato farmer, I think. But in the middle of the day, generally, tomato plants will droop because it's really hot. It, and they, ju they just kind of droop. And, and I would go up there, I'd look at them, I'd think, they're dying. <laughs> oh no. But they weren't, they weren't dying, it was just the heat. But what God says, the picture that we have is, He says, <coughs> It won't fear when he comes. Your leaves are going to stay green. You're going to make it through. You should be encouraged this morning, brothers and sisters. You should choose to choose to be blessed and put your hope and trust in God. And you're not anxious in the year of drought. I love this picture, for it never stops producing fruit. What a beautiful picture of productivity. You and I sometimes, and sometimes there are times like that, we're holding on by the skin of our teeth, by our fingernails, right? You're trying to make it. And we go through times like that. But here is a beautiful picture of abundance and sufficiency and provision. Because you know what? When fruit is produced on a tree, it feeds more than one person, doesn't it? It's a blessing. Do you mean, brothers and sisters, that you can go through this year and have times of heat and drought and not only be sustained yourself, but sustain and bless others? Yes. 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 That's our choice. That's the blessing of God for those who say, God, I'm going to depend on you. Not for those who just say, oh yeah, I, God, I depend on you too, but I'm going to figure out my own way. And if all else fails, okay, God, what do you want to do? Instead, first, oh God, you're my source. You're my source. Does that make sense to us this morning? I hope it does. I hope it does. Now, what does Jesus say? So that's the passage in Jeremiah. Here's the Old Testament passage. And very quickly, um, let's look also at the New Testament passage. I, I chose this picture because this bird is everywhere in Hong Kong, isn't it? I even know the name of this bird. Those of you that don't, you don't care about birds, right? It is a red-whiskered bulbul. B-U-L-B-U-L. Did you know that? Now you know something else. But that's not the Word of God. That's just, that's my bird book that tells me that. Jesus is talking. So we looked at the passage in Jeremiah. The, the, the Lord says. So we come to <coughs> the New Testament, Matthew 6. Those of us that are pretty familiar with our Bibles, Matthew 6 is part of what? Ah, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. And if you go back to Matthew 5, the beginning of Matthew 5, Jesus calls his disciples. He sits down, and his disciples come to him, and he starts teaching, and he starts preaching. How does the Sermon on the Mount begin? How does it begin? Yes. Blessed are the. Blessed are the. Blessed are the. This is exactly what we're talking about this morning. So Jesus starts off talking about what is a blessed life? What is a blessed life? And he starts to talk. And I want you to imagine with me. Uh, so we're still talking about a life that is blessed or is cursed. We've looked at these ex uh, uh, descriptions, the Old Testament. And um, <coughs> here's the New Test here is a, a companion, a New Testament passage. And so Jesus is sitting down on the mountainside, and he talks to his disciples, those who've come to him, not just the casual, oh yeah, but for those who are drawn and those who will follow after Jesus. And he says, therefore I tell you, do not, be wor do not worry, there's that word again, or be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. And you know what I think? Jesus was such a wonderful teacher. Oh, we, I, 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 I try to learn from him as I study and as I prepare. Jesus was seated on the mountainside. There were a lot of birds in, in Galilee. And I can imagine as Jesus is talking, because you know he's the best teacher, um, he's talking, and some birds fly overhead, and Jesus, I, to me, this is the picture, says, 
look at the birds. I, 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 that's what I think. That's what I can imagine. And his disciples look up at the birds. And then Jesus says, he says, they don't sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Those of you, depending on the translations, <coughs> excuse me, that you read, this expression here, uh, in King James, um, therefore I tell you, do not worry or be anxious. In the King James, those of us that are really familiar with the King James, do you remember what it says? Some of you may have it. It says, take no thought for, right? Take, take no thought for. I was, I was doing some studying, uh, as I was studying yesterday, that expression, we use a lot of words in English, but it's actually a single Greek word. And do you know what the word means, that one word? It means to be pulled in many directions. Now, I gave you the worry, the old German word that we use in English, to be strangled or choked. This word um, that's used right here means to be pulled in many directions. And I want to ask you something. When you are really worried at times or really anxious at times, does that describe how your thoughts and your brain, how, how it feels? You're just pulled in every direction, right? How many of you, when you're really worried and you're really anxious, you can't even keep your thoughts clear or straight, right? You're trying to whatever, and it's this and it's this, and you start imagining, what if, what if? And, and your thought, you're just pulled apart. You're just pulled in so many different directions. And you start thinking, what if this happens? I understand. Those of you who are parents at times that are especially, carry, and you carry your children on your hearts, I'm sure there are times when you think, what if this happens? What if they do this? What if? And, 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 this, and Jesus talks to us, all of us, not just worried parents, but all of us. And what he wants to say to us is this. He says, are you not much more valuable than these birds? What, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Now some of you this morning, I can read your thoughts. Did you know that? I can read your thoughts. And you are communicating to me, yes, but Pastor Jennifer, my worries this morning are far greater than what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink for lunch? McDonald's is down the road. You can always go to McDonald's whether you want to or not. We're not worried about putting food in our mouths, are we? I, I trust there's no hungry person in Lighthouse today that doesn't have the resources for food. But if you do, we want to make sure you eat. And I mean that. I'm not, jo I'm not joking about that. But few of us probably worry about eat or drink or what we're going to wear. Now some of us may work. Sometimes on Saturday nights I worry about what I'm going to wear on Sunday morning. And I think, what am I going to wear? I'm preaching today. Okay, I have to, I have to whatever. But I can tell you, I never worry about do I have enough clothes to wear. As all of you know, Pastor Jennifer always has enough clothes to wear. And I'm trying to get rid of some of those things. So I'm joking a little bit, but I want to be very serious here. Because some of you are communicating to me right now, you don't understand. I have far greater worries than this. I, you do. You do. You're not worried about clothing or food or this. You say, I'm worried about my marriage. I'm worried about my family. I'm worried about my business. I'm worried about my health. I have worries that I have concerns. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm doing everything I can do. I, I have big things, Pastor Jennifer. I have big burdens. It's not these little light things. Let me say something to you this morning from Jesus. Yeah? Jesus says, verse 25, Do not worry or be anxious about your life. Now, he was talking to people. It was a simple society. It was a simple culture, and the biggest worries generally were food and clothing for most people. We live in a different society. We have different issues. So Jesus used examples that were suitable for them. If Jesus were standing here preaching this morning, he'd use a different example. 
He would use one that would touch us in our 21st, under, 21st century understanding of business and family and school and pressures. That's what, that's what he would do. Why? Because Jesus always speaks our language. He always understands our needs. He always knows our situations. And so to cover all of that, Jesus uses this word life this word life here, do you know that there were six different words, there's six words he could have used and they all could have been translated life in English. Six, okay? Six different words, but he chose this particular word. None of us are Greek scholars here, but we've got Greek, we've got um, <coughs> Greek resources. Do you know what this word means? This particular word means something different from the other five words. And this word means both your natural life and your body, soul, and spirit. It means your whole life. It means every part of your life. And so Jesus says to us this morning, I don't want you to worry. I don't, want to, I don't want you to be anxious. Oh, I've got big things. I've got complicated things. I've got, I'm doing everything I can and I've not been able to solve the problem. And God says, Jesus says, don't worry about your life. All of those things you're worried about, don't worry about them. Look, he's taking care of the birds. You're more, more important to him than the birds. And then he gives another example. And I see Jesus again. And this is what I imagine. He's seated there on the mountainside and all oh, Galilee, northern, northern Palestine, when they're, when, during, the, during times of rains or whatever. It's beautiful. They're, they're wildflowers. They're lilies out in the field. And I can imagine Jesus pointing out along the mountainside where these beautiful flowers are growing. Can't you see them that way? Say, can, can't you see Jesus saying, look, look, look at this. And he says, and what else does he say next? And then he says, <coughs> He says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't work or make their clothing. But Solomon wasn't dressed as nicely as they are. And so then he says, and if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today, thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Oh, oh you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. And so we see this. And so he gives these two examples just as, as God gave two examples in Jeremiah. And you say, yeah, but... Uh, it's not coming together for me yet. In Jeremiah, God said, well, there's this and there's this, and we're blessed if we're, we're that. So th does this mean God is just, God's going to take care of me? No problem? Mm. Stay with me. The next part says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your, what word does he use for God? Heavenly Father. Do you know how he begins this passage? Your Heavenly Father. Do you know how he ends this passage? Your Heavenly Father. Jesus could have said God. In other places he says God. But here he says your Heavenly Father. Why? Because he loves you. He's not mean. He's not bad. He's not hard. He's your Heavenly Father. And he says, here we go. Ready for the title? Verse 33. You said, well, we're going to get to first? We're going to get to first. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here's the answer, brothers and sisters. We want a life of blessing. We want these things. Oh, Lord, there's, there's, there's this problem. I'm trying to solve this, and I'm trying to solve that. And you and I, as humans, we look at our problems. We look at our needs. We look at the things that have to be worked out and we're just human and what we do is we make a target for our problem we make a target for our need and we try to solve it we try to fix it we try to work it out and we use all of our resources don't we some of you have used all of your resources and you're still so worried and you're so anxious and God is saying there's another road I want you to take and it's a road of blessing and the road of blessing for you is seek me first. Don't go after the problem first. Don't try to fix it all first. Seek me first. Come to me first. Make me a priority in your li life. Make my ways a priority in your life. And just in case we say, what does it mean to seek God in His righteousness? I included it right here. His way of doing and being right. That's Honestly, that's, that's what it means. His way of doing and being right. 
Seek God. He's, God says, seek me first. Some of us, God's the last one we seek. When, we, when we've exhausted all of our resources or we lump God in with all of our other resources just as if we're all, they're all on the same par. What I want to say to you this morning is God says, I want to bless you this year. But to bless you, your, for me to bless you and your life, your life has to be in order. Your life has to be in order. How is our life in order? By seeking Him first. By seeking Him first. It, it, really, it really is that simple. It really is that simple. We're trying to meet our needs. We're trying to make things happen. We're trying to work it out. And God says, get your life in order. Seek me first. Seek me first. Now as we close very, very briefly and very, very quickly, because my car's on the street and I don't want to pay $325 to the <laughs> Hong Kong government. You think I'm kidding. If I'm going to have to give $325 to anybody, I want to give it to God. Some of you this morning are saying, okay, how do I do that? I seek God. When you come to the Bible and when you go to God, may I encourage you just start saying, God, I've been going at this all wrong. I've been trying to figure it out. So God, what do you say? God, what does your word say? And when you come to the word of God and he speaks to your heart about something, just do it. Just, just do it. Just put it into practice. You say, well, there's so much. The Bible's huge. I didn't say that. God knows. God knows you can't get it all. God knows you can't swallow it all at one time. But he will give it to you and he will direct you to the things that you need in his word. If you will say, God, I come to you. God, I'm, I'm putting you first and I'm seeking you first. Now, two examples and we really are going to close. Let me give you one example. You say, give me an example. Here's an example for you. Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. How do we put first and blessing? How does it fit together? Here's one example for you, okay? This is the practical application. There are many, many more. Ready? Look at what it says. Honor the Lord with your wealth and possessions. You say, I ain't got wealth. <laughs> I don't either, but you've got possessions. With what we have. And with the first fruits of all your harvest. Then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. See, a lot of us are doing everything with our possessions and our income first. And we're saying, if I have anything left over, then God, you can have that. <laughs> Here's the practical application. Honor the Lord. What does it mean to honor? To honor means to give place to, to give the right place to. It means to give the appropriate place to, so we seek Him first. Does that make sense to you this morning? I, I truly, I don't want to offend anyone, I don't want to whatever, but it's really on my heart to talk about what God says to us about offerings and tithes and giving. Because I think a lot of us need that, to kind of get that in order in our lives. And when we do, the blessing of the Lord will be upon our lives in this area. I really mean it. But here's an example for you this morning. And here's what God says. You honor me with what you have and the first fruits. Not, oh God, you get what's left over and oh, here God, you can have this. With the first fruits. It's our hearts, right? That goes back to seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then God takes care of verse 10. Your barns will be completely filled. We're working so hard to fill our barns, aren't we? Oh God, I need this, I need that. God says, you need me. Honor me. I'll take care of that. I'll take care of the results. And your vats will overflow with, with new wine. You want one more example? Let me give you one more example. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Look at this. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there, remember, you say, you say what does this have to do? It has to do. Because what is seeking God and His righteousness? It is that we're trying to, we want to live in the way that God's telling us to live. So here's the example. And this is just an example. There are many, many more. You come to church. You bring your gifts to God. You say, you mean my offering? It can be anything. You come to church. Okay? You come before God. Oh God, I honor you with my praise and my worship. Lord, I honor you with my offering. All of these things. And you remember your brother has something against you. You've wronged somebody. Or you think you've wronged somebody. Or, some, or somebody, whatever. What does he say? This is, uh-uh. 
Who? Jesus. Jesus says, leave your, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, leave your gift there in front of the altar. What's that word? What's that word? First. 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 You see, you and I, oh, we want to do all these things for God, this and that. See, God, I do this. I God, do, God, I do that. And God says, no, I can't bless that. I won't bless that. I want you first to do what I tell you to do. I want you first to honor me, and I want you to honor me by doing what I say to do. I want you to honor me by living in my ways. I want you to honor me. Take care of that first. Take care of that what? First. And then come and offer your gift. Then what we bring to the Lord is blessed. It's blessed, right? If we don't take care of things out of order in our lives first, there's no blessing. There's no blessing. Now you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, you're kind of ending on a kind of a downer note there and whatever, but it's time to end. That's just an example for you. Because I wanted to give you, I told you this morning, I wanted to give you a practical example. I wanted to give you some practical examples. And these are just some other practical examples. But we come to a close this morning and we're going to pray. Okay? Seek God in His ways first. And He will bless you by providing all you need. You need wisdom for a recalcitrant child? Seek God first. God, I come to you. God, what are your ways? God, what do you say? You're working in a difficult work situation. You've been trying to work it out. You've been trying to make things right. Seek God first. Let God work out the work situation. God loves you and he wants to bless you. He wants to bless me too. And He gives us choices and He gives us roads we can take whereby we will enjoy the abundant blessing of the Lord in 2019, whether there's drought or heat and in times of plenty as well. Your blessing will not depend on your circumstances. Your blessing depends on your relationship with your God. So whatever you're carrying, and whatever you're struggling with, you've been trying to solve for yourself, Lord, we bring it to you right now. God, it's not a gift that we're bringing. Lord, it's a big mess that we're bringing. It's a problem. And God, we have been, some of us, we have been throwing every resource we have at it or at the person, and we've not been able to work it out or figure it out. Lord, some of us are going through difficulties that have been ongoing it's been drought for a long time and God we've gotten away from you a little bit and worry has been choking us and, anxi and anxiety has been pulling us in all directions oh God we don't want the enemy stealing killing and destroying in our lives in our families in our work in any area we come to you we seek you first God is your people <coughs> help us to seek you first in your kingdom and trust that you're going to add everything that we need as we go through this year. Thank you for your word to us this morning. Show us how to obey and show us how to put it into practice. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.